Howdy, folks. It's your old pal David Cobb here. Welcome to Democracy in Action, the weekly program on the Green News Network. And as we always do, a hat tip to Gil Scott Heron, a reminder, the revolution will not be televised, but it will be brought to you over non-corporately sources of news, information, analysis, like the Green News Network, like all of the different ways that we hear from rogue journalist Caitlin Johnstone. Caitlin, welcome back to Democracy in Action. G'day, Dave. How are you going? What a week, mate. <laughs> what a <laughs> week. It has been, right? And not only yeah. are you reminding us that it, we've had a hell of a week together, you're reminding us that you're actually Australian, which I really appreciate that. You really laid on the good A there. So, Oh, yeah. uh, well, I'm nervous. I'm nervous. It's going to come out. I might get a bit more Aussie because this, this, yeah, this is... <laughs> Well, big deal for me right now. Yeah, and so look, uh, some folks will not know that it's been a hell of a week for you and me. Uh, others will probably be very well aware of it. Uh, some people may be tuning in for the first time wondering, hey, what is this that all, all I've got about? Kayla and I are definitely going to get uh, into all of that. Uh, and Michael O'Neill, the technical director, uh, Michael, would you put in the uh, link to the, uh, to the article uh, that Caitlin and I wrote together in response to a series of what I can euphemistically call criticism pieces against Caitlin and myself. I got to say, Caitlin, it really felt like really pretty much just smear and hit pieces, right? I, it really did feel that way to me. I'm, I know what criticism feels like. I've been subject to lots of criticism. I've offered criticism of other people. I'll be honest, that did not feel like very valid criticism, but I am proud of how we responded to it. Uh, and we are going to get into that. So I want to remind people that this medium only works because you are tuning in. I'm going to ask folks to please comment. Please share it with other people. Remember that the way this algorithm works and the reason that we're continuing to build an audience together, that is Caitlin and myself and the Green News Network and all our various programs is because of you, the viewer. So please comment. Please like. Please share. So, Caitlin, before we get into uh, the, the, the crux of it, I do want to point out that you and I are in basic agreement with like the, what's happening in the world, which is to say the basic ecology of this planet is being assaulted. Uh, a racist, sexist, and class oppressive society is created by a very small oligarchy, a small ruling elite that masquerades as democracy, when in point of fact, it's a plutocracy. Uh, we agree on so much, but we do have some disagreements. So I'd actually like to invite you to frame out, what did this controversy come from, from your perspective? Uh, honestly, I, I don't think it came from the actual, I mean, we'll get to the subject and we'll get to our disagreement about it, but I I, it was so disingenuously framed that I don't believe it actually came from the issue itself. I don't think it was fair criticism. I think it was a hit piece. I think I think that, that they they created this thing out of something else because they couldn't actually say why they they don't like me or why they don't want me in their little club. Uh, it just doesn't work for them in some way, and that way is too embarrassing to say out loud. So they created this a very disingenuous. Uh, smear, and that was that I support white nationalists. So that that's their whole gear. And anyone who knows me, anyone who's read a lot of me, will know that I go nowhere near white nationalists. And even in the piece that they're trying to critique there, I make the point of saying that Richard Spencer is someone who I, you know, don't even like sharing a planet with, let alone, you know, support or align with. That's another word that they keep using that I never used. So, um, yeah, the, that, that they, they've, you know, it's in the, the first paragraphs of those two things. And then the guilt by association is that you, of course, must support white nationalists if you support me and I support white nationalists, which right. I never... Yeah, there, yeah. <laughs> there is a really kind of crazy, like, purity test uh, that is both driven by, for me, sort of emotional, subjective, like just almost a tantrum, right? Uh, uh, but there's also sort of a, a, a purity test that is exactly the opposite of organizing. It's exactly the opposite of actually building consensus uh, around what I think you, like, and I want to be clear, uh, Caitlin, my sense is 
that not only do you and I mostly agree, I think that the overwhelming um, number of Americans and actually people on the planet basically agree we ought to have a peaceful, just, democratic, and, and ecologically sustainable society. And our social, political, and economic institutions ought to reflect our commitment to peace, justice, democracy, and sustainability. Right? Absolutely. And we, we had the medicine and we need to get it out of there. And there's these gatekeepers to to us that can continue to push us back. You know, these kind of church ladies who won't let us speak in different ways to different people. Um, and it's just, it's become like this kind of lefty religion. But we are the medicine and we need to get it out there. We need to, because people are crying for this. They're, at, well, they're literally dying for this. We have the solutions. And so I am willing to throw myself into the media war, no matter what it takes, I have to, you know, I was on The View this week apparently, like, and that's, you know, I that's, that's that wasn't my ambition in life. I, I you know, I, I would prefer just to be a nice housewife who worked at Macca's and writes poetry and her site like, but we've got to do this. Like the right. alarm bells are ringing. We are near term extinction and I'm willing to, pre like, I'm prepared to throw myself at this. So, yeah, and uh, the fact that uh, these same church ladies, these same kind of gatekeepers of the coolness uh, came in and they're, you know, hectoring uh, me about being a white nationalist, which they know is not true. They know deeply that that's not true. That is a lie and they know that, but they're prepared to say it because, I don't know, I'm just, I must be kind of like annoying them in some way. I'd, anyway, we will never know why. I got a sneaking suspicion, Caitlin, it's because you're a woman. I mean, I'll just, I'm going to actually name it. I actually, do. like, I'm blessed to be around a lot of strong women and was raised by one, you know, uh, uh, and that's actually what this feels like to me, at least as it relates to you. And of course, there's a whole nother little sort of microcosm of people who just want to hate on me and are now trying to hate on you because you want to associate with me, right? So in a weird way, uh, you know, there's like, what what did the kids say these days? Uh, my haters make me famous. I kind of feel like that's almost uh, one of the things that's going on here, right? Uh, and look, I'm willing, to have these, I'm willing to have these kind of conversations. So like, uh, let's, let's have them. Uh, so, you know, uh, I am going to say that uh, already we've got stuff that, that's coming out. Uh, Marcus says, call out culture is rampant on the left. Caitlin, are you familiar with the concept of call out culture? No, that's the first time I've heard it, but I, I, I get it. Call out culture. Yeah. Right. And, you know, picking, do they mean like picking on, you know, tiny areas of disagreement and blowing them up into the whole thing? I well, think what you do. Like that. Yeah. I mean, call out culture is the idea that when somebody makes a racist, sexist, or a class offensive comment, that you call it out. And there is a level at which I actually think that that is important because there has to be the struggle for clarity. And if somebody's making a mistake, you have to call their attention to it. So, uh, you know, that's one thing. But what I, what I also see is that there are some people who seem to be like watching and waiting for any mistake that anybody makes around either race or class or gender or uh, sexuality or sexual orientation. Uh, and that, I think, is what Marcus is getting at. And so, to me, the question is, are we actually engaged in good, hard political discussion and dialogue, exploring where we agree and disagree? But one thing that the left really does and, and does incessantly is, like, continue to just describe the problem. And uh, one of the things that I've really appreciated about you, Caitlin, is... See, I'm in it to win it. I actually am talking about power, about taking and exercising state power. And I know that what that means is that we have to actually get out there and organize actual human beings. Uh, the, the puppy agrees. We've got to literally get out there and have these kinds of conversations. And if people feel like any mistake that you make, it, people are going to jump onto you, uh, then it actually is not conducive to the kind of conversations that are necessary. That's right. It creates inertia. It does create inertia. And that's where we're at at the left. We are quite inert. We, we play dead, you know, we, because we're so scared of saying anything. And in doing, in writing those articles, you know, I picked 
very carefully a right winger as far as I could. You know, like you don't lowball when you want to expand the conversation and you the the uh, like the playing field of collaboration. You don't lowball. So I I, I realize Cerno is not to everyone's taste, and uh, you know he's pretty out there and like. He talks about surfing the culture of outrage as well. Like, you know, he he doesn't believe everything he tweets as well. He, he puts stuff out there just to get people looking at him and talking about him, et cetera, et cetera. But um, <clears throat> he is, you know, the kind of furthest that I could go. So, yeah, when you're trying to change that those kind of uh, levels, then, then you do go further out. And I, I feel like I need to do this to push out those walls of shame for people are like I will take the hits because people are so scared to say anything to anyone or to share any information that doesn't come from the you know correct channels that have been leftily approved by everyone so right. I we need to bust this open and I'm willing to throw myself at it so and and I have thank you for doing that like <laughs> You know, I also want to say, uh, Robbie writes in to say some criticisms against Caitlin are clearly personal, uh, but a lot of them are substantive, specifically why you are calling for an alliance with Mike Cernovich. So I want to actually put it to you. Are you calling for an alliance with Mike Cernovich? Fuck no. Not an alliance. And I hate that word. And I hate that they keep putting that word in my fucking mouth. No, I am merely saying that sometimes he comes up with some good ideas and I would like to retweet them. Please, sir. Can I, sir? Can I have some more, sir? It's bullshit that we have to, you know, we can't even use these, like, information streams. He comes up with a lot of primary source journalistic um, information that I can't use. He did such a good job on the DNC convention. He has done such a good job on the DNC fraud lawsuit, which I must say the progressive... Um, of the uh, journalism school has pretty much left in the dirt. And I would like to use some of that information. And in pushing the boundaries out that far, I have found, because I used to get criticised for having Paul fucking Craig Roberts in my articles. Like, he's, you know, a right-winger and he's like, but he's also very anti-war. And I have noticed since I actually mentioned Therno, since I've pushed it out to Therno, I haven't had one dispute about Paul Craig Roberts. So that's good. I feel like I need to push this out and say, stop being such fucking snobs and let's start collaborating on issues of convergence, small issues where we actually converge. Not, I'm not going to start, you know, retweeting his rape culture shit. Like, I'm not stupid. We're not stupid. We don't need to police each other so hard. So, you know, uh, I know that Anoa is writing in, uh, and remember, folks, I don't actually see the comments, but somebody is capturing some of them. So uh, Anoa is saying that you, quote, engage in racist behavior, end quote. So I'll just say I've not seen any indication of that in your writing, in any conversation that I've had with you. So uh, Anoa, if you want to write in, uh, the technical director will capture that. If you've got something concrete in her writing uh, that you want to uh, uh, Caitlin, to respond yeah. to, I'll actually no. ask the question. I we're not going to uh, shy away from it, but I, and and here's the thing, no. uh, Caitlin. Like, again, you and I agree probably 95 percent of the time. I do think that it is problematic uh, that Cernovich. Uh, I like. I want to be clear about something. See, yeah. I don't want not only an alignment or an alliance with Cernovich. Uh, I personally would not retweet him. I personally would not lift up any of the stuff that he's doing. What I do yeah. want to do is go to the people that he is influencing and win them over to my way of thinking. And in doing so, that it, it frankly involves and requires uh, going into pool halls and bowling alleys and, and having some conversations that other people don't actually have. Um, um, the, well, do you know that he, he is actually putting, I mean, he's, 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 He's retweeted Jill Stein just this week. He retweeted Glenn Greenwald, Mike Tracy. He he actually is seeding out our stuff through his networks as well. So you know, that. it's interesting. Yeah, that's a good point, Corey. Uh, and it, it is a reminder, I think, to me and I hope to everyone that what we're doing is trying to shift this culture. This culture yeah. is, in fact, racist, sexist, and class oppressive. And engaging in these kinds of dialogues and hard conversations 
and not just doing it with people who 100% agree with you on all things. That's yeah. the struggle for the cultural narrative. Uh, and Corey, in fact, writes in to say, if you can get people uh, who are on the right or consider themselves conservatives to support civil rights in general, I consider that a huge victory. Uh, Timothy writes in, though, to say, I don't understand how this is relevant to the Green Party. What good is dealing with Caitlin's online beef? Is that what is important for the Green Party today? So I'll take this one on, Caitlin, to tell Timothy that, remember, the Green News Network is not a Green Party platform. This is actually uh, a platform where we lift up uh, issues that are of importance to the progressive community writ large. It is certainly true that we are very Green Party friendly. I mean, I, of course, was the campaign manager for the Stein Baraka. I was the 2004 Green Party presidential candidate. I have helped to create at least a half a dozen state parties as the lawyer for the National Party. I filed the paperwork that made the Green Party of the United States one of only five national uh, Federal Election Commission recognized political parties. So my Green Party bona fides are deep, right? And I would say this, when I casually mention peace, justice, democracy, and ecology, those are the four pillars of the International Green Party movement. So in every way, I think that these conversations are, in fact, helping to build the Green Party. Uh, that, uh, uh, you know, so, so I'm absolutely uh, believing that this actually is helpful uh, to grow the Green Party and to make the Green Party relevant. Right. And, you know, yeah, I... I really support the Green Party and I think that the Green Party has the goods. Like, I think the Green Party has the medicine that the world needs. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm willing to throw myself into the machine to get it into the heart of the beast. So uh, I got to say, uh, so Michael has written, and I'm just going to read what Michael has written. Uh, Noah writes, uh, Caitlin has accused us of attacking us and Ben sent his dogs, i.e. us women of color, on her. When we asked her questions, keep in mind, uh, when we asked her questions. So, and I'm not trying to avoid anything, but that's not enough context for me to know, is it something that you can react to, or do you know what? Because I, I been, Yeah, there's been a Twitter fight about this. Uh, there was, the, there's a group of people called the Progressive Army <clears throat> that have decided that they're not going to listen to me. They they don't care what I say about it. They have decided to deliberately misunderstand me and pretend that I'm saying something else. And and she was the one before who said that I've done racist things or whatever. Um, it's a very poisonous conversation. They don't want to actually collaborate or or understand me in any way. Um, and they've taken this line that I support white nationalists and run with it uh, this and that's all that they're interested in doing they just want to destroy me so I I tried to I tried to actually talk to them but they wanted to just like you know set fire to me so that's the end of that really so me. look I, I don't they're know what their lives are but I will ask this uh, did you call a Noah violent on Twitter I said it was violent, yes. To, when you deliberately misunderstand someone or you pretend that they're saying something that they're not, it's called a straw man and it is very violent and abusive behaviour. When you actually, when you use uh, words to create a pernicious idea of someone and then you attack that and you keep attacking that with a very loud voice trying to gather everyone around to mob you, then, yeah, that's violence. Okay. And, you know, I, I think that's something that we've all got to learn as online literate citizens. When that happens, you should you should take your leave. If people aren't willing to try and understand what you're saying and they keep trying, putting words in your mouth and then fighting with them, then you should step to the side. And, yeah. All right. So, look, again, like, so the, I want to be clear. Like, I don't expect, and as I wrote in our joint piece, which I hope folks have had a chance to read, uh, you know, I really want to point out, and I can't resist pointing out, so uh, Counterpunch has written not one, not two, but literally three pieces basically, uh, you know, dragging us through the mud and not allowed us to respond uh, at all, at least in their uh, publication, uh, which is a very, like, like, that just violates any sense of journalistic integrity whatsoever. And in fact, 
uh, Joshua Frank, the managing editor, literally wrote uh, that David Cobb is important enough to criticize, but not important enough to publish. I mean, that I don't even know how to react to, to that level of sectarianness and that level of duplicity. Uh, but I also uh, want to be clear that I did write, uh, you know, that you and I, I think, have a disagreement around in what manner and to what extent uh, to engage with Cernovich. Uh, but I yeah. also want folks to understand, like, I'm not going to let a disagreement with Caitlin, even an important one, have Caitlin turn into my enemy any more than I'm going to let any other disagreement with somebody uh, turn them into an enemy, right? Uh, at the end of the day, I think it's really important to recognize that we are actually in a pitched struggle uh, for who is going to be able to rule this planet, and that currently the existing rulers uh, are a small group of sociopaths who are literally going to destroy the planet. And it's, I think, completely reasonable to have really hard-hitting, grappling conversations, uh, figure out where we agree, disagree. But this level of insistence on purity uh, is actually a very dangerous road, and it's going to continue to keep us divided. Well, it is very dangerous, you know, and they, uh, we can see how dangerous it is. Like, this smear will sit with me for years. For years, this is going to mute my voice a little bit. But, you know, and that's, that's the plan. That's the whole thing, and I don't know why they're doing it, just these little dick battles, these little ego battles, um, when just to, to, to mute me for whatever reason, uh, when they know that they are deliberately misunderstanding me. Like, they must so know that. One thing I want to do uh, also, and Michael O'Neill, this is uh, my uh, nod to you, our technical director, uh, I'm going to actually uh, play a clip on the idea of how we can talk to people who don't already agree with us. I'll ask Michael to set that up uh, and then play it. It's only two minutes and 45 seconds. And then I'm going to ask you, uh, Caitlin, uh, to respond uh, to what we play. So, Michael O'Neill, could you roll that clip, please? If you've spent any time on Earth, you might have noticed that humans are not the most rational of creatures. We make decisions based mostly on emotions instead of facts, and a lot of times we're guided by tribal instinct. Part of the problem is that the human brain evolved to help us survive, and not necessarily to help us be factually accurate. So we often respond better to social and tribal dynamics than to intellectual analysis. For example, if someone's tribe believes that Obama is a secret Muslim born in Kenya, that person probably thinks the hard proof of his US birth certificate is fake. That conclusion is neither rational nor accurate. But from a tribal perspective, it makes sense. It's safer to agree with your tribe and stay united ideologically, even if you're wrong about the facts, than to disagree and isolate yourself. Another part of the problem is that our brain is constantly protecting our worldview and sense of identity. So when our worldview is challenged, that same part of the brain that processes physical danger gets activated. This is why people sometimes react so aggressively to information that proves them wrong. And this is why it's often so hard to have an intelligent political debate. Several studies have also shown that there is a backfire effect that happens when people encounter facts that contradict their current beliefs. They actually become more convinced of their original ideas. So fighting ignorance with facts is like fighting a grease fire with water. It seems like it should work, but it actually just makes the whole thing worse. Lastly, there's the problem of lack of empathy. Several studies have found that when humans are divided into groups of any kind, we instinctively become less empathetic to members of other groups. That means that for survival's sake, we might instinctively empathize less with other races, other nationalities, and even other sports teams. This instinctive dehumanization of other groups is what makes things like slavery and genocide possible in our society. So, what can you do? If you want someone to consider factual information that clashes with their beliefs, First, you have to prevent their brain from seeing you as a personal threat. So, look for ways to identify the person as part of your tribe and you as part of theirs. Hey, we're part of the same family. Hey, we're both parents. Hey, we both still play Pokemon Go. Whatever. Anything that communicates that you're part of the same tribe. That's the first step. Second, consider the possibility that you may be wrong. Maybe the facts are not on your side, in which case admitting it will help you model to the other person that it's okay to be wrong. I understand that none of this is easy or smooth, 
But if we want to continue to function as a stable society, we have to learn to get past our own natural biases. Only when that happens, we will be able to move forward towards a better future. Peace. Well, much thanks to Alex Sequa for uh, that bit of in a, a animation. And it really, I thought, uh, Caitlin, uh, what I really like about this is it captures in both video and music and narrative storytelling a phrase that I say all the time. And that is, if I agree with you 90% of the things and 90% of the time, when we're talking together, I'd like to spend about 90% of our time talking about how we can collaborate on what we agree with and it and about only 10% of our time on the disagreement. Because one of the things that I think the left has fallen into, rather than preparing to actually take and exercise power, instead of actually engaging in real relationship building and movement building, uh, the left has gotten comfortable just criticizing and mobilizing actions. You know, Michael O'Neill knows uh, very well, and I've learned a lot from him, thinking through this idea of actually building relationships and uh, as opposed to merely or uh, merely uh, mobilizing. So, uh, Caitlin Johnstone, I'd love to get your thoughts on the clip that we just played. Right, yeah. Well, I think, yeah, the, this is the challenge that we have to evolve as a species, really. Like we've come out of these kind of little tribes and then entered into the world and those tribes have become larger and larger and we have wars and things like that. We can't, we can't collaborate with people across the lines. And now we've got the internet and these wars just are everywhere. Every, these ideological wars are everywhere. Um, and I think you're absolutely right that the, the way out of this is through creativity and not critique. Like, uh, yeah, calling people out and stuff is, is all well and good. But at the end of the day, we've got to spend the 90% of that time actually creating this new earth that we want. We have the medicine. We know exactly where we want to be. Five, ten years from now, we could have a peaceful planet that is using sustainable energy and that where we all look after each other. We know that this can happen. And it's up to us to really just get together and actually make that happen, however that is. And put aside, you know, any little quibbles that we might have about the strategy for that or just wish people well, you know. Like, yeah, like I totally get that you, Cerno is a, like a bridge too far for you, Davo. I get that. Like, he's, you know, he is friggin' out there. But I am out there. I can take that sort of energy and I can hold my shape and I can be, you know, with those sort of people. And I, you, you want me out there fighting the good fight, saying my things. Um, and so, yeah, so I'm the perfect person for that, I think, and I can totally take that on. But uh, also, we have two different roles. You're organising and I am fighting the media war and that's really, you know, that's where I see my energies are best put into fighting the false narratives and bringing down the propaganda machine that is holding all of this together as far as I can tell. So if we could just get a, like a free and fair media reporting properly on the things that are important to people, that would be a massive start and a massive leg up to people in the Green Party who are trying to get their ideas out there because these ideas are only being held down by mind viruses, you know. They're, People still believe Reaganomics is a thing. They still think trickle down is a thing. Like, you know, there's so much misinformation, so much education that needs to be done. And it is worth noting that the proletariat, you know, that we're meant to be championing here, they are not so educated. You know, they aren't, they are prone to uh, blaming people that, that aren't to blame because they don't know a lot of stuff about stuff, you know. We need to be in there and talking. Like, or else we're just, we're not a part of the conversation. You know, I really appreciate uh, that, uh, Caitlin. And I, I guess I'll conclude with this to, to viewers of the Green News Network and this show, Democracy in Action. You know, Melissa Figueroa and I are now traveling around the country giving movement schools for revolutionaries. Uh, in those movement schools, we've broken them into modules. And the very first module is a conversation around the reality of patriarchy, white supremacy, 
capitalism and imperialism. So we don't like, and I, I talk about it all the time and I don't back away from that. And we talk about how neoliberalism is actually morphing into neo-fascism. We talk about how to look at history and the fact that Mel and I and lots of others looking at this believe that we are in a pregnant moment of conjuncture, that, that we're nearing a crisis moment where things are gonna break. And I think, honestly, what's really interesting, they're gonna break either to the, uh, to the left, to the hard right, and there are some folks trying to hold on to what I'll call the neoliberal center, right? Uh, right. Actually, I don't think that it can continue. I think it's yeah. literally gonna break either left or right, so I am doing everything that I can to help build a genuine left in this country, to educate, agitate, and organize. I'm trying to bring as many people to break left as is absolutely possible. And I'll conclude with this, maybe I'm wrong. I have enough humility uh, to recognize that I'm just doing my best. If I'm making mistakes, I'm not doing them on purpose. Uh, and like I invite people who wanna work with me and Mel uh, to, to work with us. If you don't wanna work with us, at least don't try to hinder us. You know, I wow. work really hard uh, Caitlin, not to throw rocks at erstwhile allies. I'll engage in constructive critique. I'll listen to constructive critique. But I would ask people to please have a little uh, more solidarity with one another and to recognize the difference between constructive critique and tearing somebody down. Right. And on that, can I say, please keep reading Counterpunch. They're the best lefty progressive outlet that we've got. Um, I, you know, and I hope that maybe some of this outrage has created more clicks for them and kept them going because, you know, they, they, they lend a platform to some really important voices. Um, so, yeah, let's let <laughs> well, <laughs> on that note, we need everyone. There aren't many. Of them. And, and, and I want to thank, I know that the comments were coming in fast and furious. Uh, remember, folks, this is a weekly show. Uh, you know, we're, we'll continue to have uh, lots of guests and lots of different conversations. Uh, and for my point of view, I think it was actually a good thing. I mean, sometimes this show just becomes a rah-rah cheerleading each other. And, and I'm proud that this show is a place where we'll hold space to actually have uh, real conversations, including hard conversations, including where we disagree. So with that, I want to thank uh, Caitlin Johnstone, uh, my guest. She will be back next month. Uh, we're not abandoning her or these conversations. I want to thank Mel Figueroa, who is the executive director of the Green News Network. And I especially want to thank Michael O'Neill, the technical director, who every week keeps this and many other programs uh, actually going Lastly, I want to thank you, the viewer, and remind you that the only reason that this exists is because you are watching, you are commenting, and most importantly, please continue to share this. Let's get this message of peace, justice, democracy, and ecology out there as many places as we can. Let's not hate the corporate media. Let's create our own media. Peace.